Good afternoon. The April 6, 2016 meeting of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging is now being called to order. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Francine, will you please call the roll? Please hear here present when I call your name. Commissioner Allen is absent. Chair Fotheringham. Here. Commissioner Gitt. Present. Commissioner Gorbach. Here. Commissioner Hagee. Here. Vice Chair Healy. Here. Commissioner Norkin. Here. Commissioner O'Connor. Present. And Commissioner Sentes. Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now is the time for public comments in our meeting. If you'd like to make a public comment at this meeting, you should fill out a, uh, a blue public comment speaker card, which are found on the back table there, and uh, bring it forward or give it to Francine. Um, so far, I have one public comment card. We have a special presentation during public comments today from our transportation manager, Mike Hauser, who's going to bring us uh, an update on our transit master plan. Take it away, Mike. outreach sessions actually yesterday and so I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the project where we're at right now some of the major recommendations that we expect to come out of the consultants report and also a brief um, summary of where we're going from here so the purpose of it is to provide a, a, a long and short-term visioning for our transit operations. Even though the city has been providing transit service to its residents for over 30 years, we've really never had a formalized plan on how we should approach service delivery. So they looked at and assessed our, our current services against other agencies of similar sizes and types and looked for ways that we can do to, to enhance the service that we are already providing. And also to look at our role as part of a more regional approach to delivering transit service. I think as the council is aware, the City of Thousand Oaks is one of the founding members of the East County Transit Alliance, and one of the first things we did was work to bring inner city dial -a ride service uh, to seniors in all of four of the agencies that currently participate in that program. It's a multi-step process. We actually started planning for this project nearly three years ago when we applied for competitive grant, uh, grant funding. And we've been uh, engaged in this process now for close to seven months. And we're, we'll be wrapping this process up here in the next uh, 60 days or so. Involved uh, uh, evaluating the services, uh, doing anal uh, analysis from census data and other data that's available. Uh, we had the goal setting and, and, and looking at revisioning. We did a whole bunch of public uh, outreach sessions as well as surveys for both riders and non-riders alike. Um, from our first round of 10 public outreach sessions that we held in late November and December, a couple key themes came across. And most of what I'm going to talk about today relates to the bus service, although I want to assure you that the dial ride service hasn't been ignored and there will be a number of recommendations coming out of that. But there was a request for more frequent service, uh, uh, complaints that the current routes are too long, a need for increased number of bus stops and expanded service to other areas of the community, and also an expansion of both the bus and dollar ride service hours. Um, some of the things that the consultant is looking at is currently our bus routes do long loops in one direction, and what they want to do is to provide service that goes up and down the same corridor in both directions. They want to reduce the average travel time, increase the connectivity between our service and the regional service, such as the VCTC intercity buses, uh, the metro buses, and the LA uh, DOT buses. And the only way that we can really effectively do that is to get all of the bus routes on uh, the same or similar schedule and to reduce waiting time at transfer points. And in, in fact, the Oaks Mall is the single heaviest used bus stop in our community. So in terms of bus service, they've divided up some of their recommendations. I'll be going over real briefly some of the main ones, but um, their current suggestions to council will be to um, split the current gold route up into two separate routes, 
shorten the green route, um, provide more bi-directional service uh, to the existing red route along Thousand Oaks Boulevard, do the same thing on Hillcrest, and also increase the service, service coverage of the Metrolink shuttle, which goes uh, into Moore Park. They want us to develop a phone reservation uh, application process for uh, the dial-a-ride service, as well as continue to expand on the travel training program that the Council on Aging's a Senior Adult Master Plan Transportation Committee started several years ago, and the city recently expanded that to a, a yet an additional program that we hope to offer somewhere between 12 and 16 sessions this calendar year. Then after the phase one is complete, phase two looks to include uh, a new service uh, originating in Tokes, uh, actually in Newbury Park, and going all the way to Agora Hill so that you can get all the way across town and never have to change buses, along with increased service uh, uh, to um, California Lutheran University and Los Robles Hospital. Again, as mentioned before, an extension of service hours, um, implementation on a demonstration basis of Sunday bus service, as well as weekend ECTA service. Currently, it's only offered the inner city dollar ride Monday through Friday. And then to look at alternative ways we can service some of the less dense rural, uh, rural areas of our community that don't meet the threshold for doing fixed route service, but still there are our transportation needs. And then lastly, as part of phase three, an introduction of a uh, fixed route service between our community and Simi Valley, probably meeting up in the Wood Ranch area, along with increased uh, service to the green route. I would tell you that as a staff person, one of the items there in phase three, I really think is probably a phase one item, and that would probably be, be my recommendation uh, to council once, once we get to that point. And then finally, uh, since the Oaks Mall is our most popular bus stop, we really need to establish a more formal presence there. For those of you that have used the service, you know it's, it's basically a long curb alongside the outdoor portion of the, uh, of the mall. And while it's a, a nice and well-maintained, we think it needs to be something a little bit more formalized with more seating and perhaps some amenities and perhaps even uh, ticket sale uh, availability. So if anybody is interested in the Transit Master Plan, uh, we do maintain a website specific to this. And the, the plan itself, the draft plan, is going to be released in a few days. I didn't have time in this presentation to show you all the maps for the various routes, but those are available online right now. We also have the TO Transit uh, website where we have a wealth of information about our services and regional services. I will be making a presentation uh, to the Youth Commission this evening and then another, pres actually a full-on presentation to the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Committee later this month. Uh, tentatively, we expect the plan to go to City Council for their comment and review perhaps as soon as late June with a final adoption uh, of the plan hopefully uh, in either July or August and then we'll get, uh, we'll get started on it immediately. I would expect that many of the Phase uh, 1 items could be accomplished in uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, some of the Phase 3 items may take as long as two and a half or three years to fully implement. And so with that, I'm available if there are any questions. Sorry, what are the options for public comment on the draft plan that you say is going to be released shortly? Yes, so if anybody does have uh, any comments to the plan, uh, you, can, you can submit those uh, to the, the Transit Master Plan website. There is a link there to which you can submit it. You can also provide uh, comments uh, to the TO Transit email account, and that is TO Transit, all one word, at TOAKS, T O A K S dot org. Or you. And the draft plan will be available on the TO Transit Master Plan website, website in, a f in just a few days. Thank you. And it will be several hundred pages of, of fun reading. Uh, and to be, and I, I want to emphasize that even though much of what I talked about revolves around the bus service, we actually looked, asked them to look at nearly a 55 different components of transit service, everything from the bus to the dial ride to bicycle, pedestrians, uh, ride sharing, Alternative things such as Uber and Lyft, uh, we, we asked them to you know, run the gamut of, of how can we provide the most robust service we can to our residents that we can afford for the next 10 to 20 years. 
Karen? Thank you. I was at your public outreach meeting on Saturday, and I think it was terrific. I think you did a great job explaining everything, and I learned a lot, and I just I wanted to thank you for that time. Appreciate it. Tony? Um, in terms of the study, is it going to address pricing and discounts for seniors and things like that? I have to say that I, I, I myself am not privy to the document yet. I haven't seen it myself. Uh, they will be uh, reviewing fares in our fare structure. I can't at this point, though, tell you what their specific recommendations are going to be. I will tell you that compared to some of our peers, uh, we have, in some areas, we have very competitive uh, fares. In other areas, we may not be as competitive as we could be or have as wide a variety of fare options as we might might want to consider. Uh, Mike, I just, uh, uh, just want to thank you for mentioning about the, tra the transit training, and I'm so glad the city continued it, and I really appreciate your mentioning that it was brought, started out by our uh, transportation SAMP team, and Jane Messier is here today who worked on that for many, many countless hours, so thank you, Jane. And thank you for continuing that good thank program. Uh, both programs very highly successful. And in fact, we had only anticipated on having to do 10 sessions this year. And in the first 60 days of the program, we already have five sessions booked. So it's proving to be very popular. Thank you, Jane. Any other questions from commissioners? All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Okay, we've now reached the point in our program for uh, liaison reports, and the first report is on the Ventura County Area Agency on Aging. Um, one of the things that the uh, VCAAA has been actively engaged in recently is developing a, a, uh, an update, uh, a new five-year plan. Uh, it's master strategic plan for the next five years and so forth, uh, and they had a public comment session on this uh, last month. The um, plan is, uh, I think, planned to, scheduled to be completed by in the next couple of months, so probably by the end of May and so forth, you should be able to get a, a copy of the final plan. Uh, it's, uh, it's fairly interesting reading and useful. There's a, for those of you who aren't familiar with the VCAAA, it's the countywide uh, counterpart and so forth to the Council on Aging. Each of the major cities in, uh, in uh, Ventura County has its own area agency on aging, um, or its own um, Council on Aging, uh, and the VC AAA uh, represents the, uh, the county's interest. Um, and I learned, for example, that in my zip code, and yes, there's information in here that's down to the zip code level and so forth, that, that over 7% of the uh, seniors in my zip code are uh, below the federal poverty level, which is something that I found uh, a little bit astounding and alarming and so forth. But uh, uh, I recommend the plan to you and it uh, is completed and so forth as a source of information about how uh, seniors are faring in our community. Don't uh, rely totally on the Council on Aging. Uh, I would like to turn the uh, floor over to uh, uh, Donna, for to introduce uh, our next liaison report. I have the privilege of introducing Rick Tanaka, who's the director of the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program, and he's going to be telling you all the good things that are coming up. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Council. I'm excited to be here as always. I have a few things that I am particularly excited to announce. One is the Conejo Senior Volunteer Program Advisory Council is currently seeking business leaders, nonprofit agency personnel, uh, those working in the fields of aging or volunteerism to serve on its advisory council. New appointments are now being considered for three-year terms. Applications are available at the CSVP office over at the Global Adult Community Center. Uh, or on the CRPD website on the Conejo Senior Volunteer Program page. Um, applications are due by a April 11th, so I encourage you to consider it and mention to your friends and associates that may be interested in helping the Conejo Senior Volunteer Program to further its efforts in the community to uh, help volunteer opportunities be available for adults age 55 and over. I also want to remind everyone that the CSVP free tax assistance service is still taking place. It is 
currently Monday through Thursday at the Conejo Creek South Community Room, which is across the street from the Global Center. And it's also on Wednesdays at the Newbury Park Library. This is from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on all of those days mentioned. This is a free service for seniors age 60 years of age or older or for um, individuals with a household income of 54000 or less, regardless of age. This team of volunteers has been doing a great job, has been offering great service. A uh, common question is, when is the least wait? And so far that has been late morning, early afternoon is when there tends to be not much of a wait at all, though as the April 18th deadline draws near, that is going to change. Yes, I said April 18th. The IRS has extended the cutoff date to the 18th this year because of April 15th falling on a Friday. April 18th is your last day to get the service done. Now, I am particularly excited to announce that tickets are now on sale for Amadeus. This is being performed at Conejo Players Theater. They're doing a special performance for Conejo Senior Volunteer Program to help us with our fundraising efforts. The performance will be on Saturday, May 14th. It's going to start with a backstage wine and cheese reception which has been a lot of fun in years past. The performance begins, the curtain, curtain goes up at two o'clock for the show. And then after the show, we have a number of great raffle prizes as well. It's gonna be a fun event and it helps to support the Conejo Senior Volunteer Program. Tickets are available for $20 each, limited supply of tickets. They're available at the Global Adult Community Center. That is all I have to say at this point, thank you. Many of you know of Rick, and he also today has the privilege of announcing all of the good things happen at the Goebel Adult Community Center. And some of them overlap, and some, some of them are different. So we'd love to hear about them. Well, good afternoon. It's good to see you all again today. <laughs> uh, Goebel Adult Community Center has a lot of fun stuff taking place as well. Take me out to the ball game. If you are a Dodger fan, Come on out to the Goebel Stadium and watch the Dodgers play against the San Francisco Giants tomorrow, Thursday, April 7th at 1 p.m. at the Goebel Center. Cost is $5 per person, and participants will enjoy the company of other Dodger fans, Dodger dogs, popcorn, peanuts, and more. Tickets can be purchased at the front desk. Also, there is a community garage sale taking place this weekend as long as weather permits hopefully the weather will cooperate this weekend and it will be bright sunny day on sunday april 10th from eight to one if you love a good garage sale this is the place for you shoppers can enjoy 40 plus garage sales in one place at the global center parking lot it's a great event a lot of great stuff to find there um, also coming up, History Comes Alive. This ongoing series, History Comes Alive, this time presents Queen Elizabeth I on Sunday, April 17th from 2 to 3.15 at the Global Center. Val Raines steps back into time to portray Queen Elizabeth I of England. Uh, tickets are $5 and can be purchased at the front desk. And, but wait, there's more. Tickets for Cinco de Mayo and Mother's Day Tea Party are on sale uh cinco de mayo celebration on thursday may 5th at 5 p.m tickets will go on sale on april 15th at the front desk for seven dollars a person you're going to enjoy a taco bar that's always a lot of fun margaritas live entertainment and dancing so bring your dancing shoes tickets for the intergenerational mother's day tea party on saturday may 7th from 10 to noon will go on sale on April 15th at the front desk for $5 per person. Mothers, daughters, grandmothers, and great-grandmothers will enjoy a selection of tea samplings, tiny tea sandwiches, mini desserts, and more. Tickets can be purchased at the front desk at the Global Center. Feel free to call 805-381-2744. Any questions about any of these events? Thank you. Thank you, Rick. It sounds like lots of exciting events. Hope you uh, will at least go to one. The T sounds exciting to me. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Norma. I would now like to recognize Vice Chair Healy, who will introduce our commissioner reports. 
one thing you should make sure you go to is that garage sale that Rick just told us about because Canal Valley Village is going to have two tables. Mm -hmm. So that is a cool thing. Great prices, really nice people. So definitely, Rick, and we're going to all pray for no rain on Sunday, at least one day without rain. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Gitt, who will talk to us about where we are on the Senior of the Year. Tony? No, I'm waiting. She's waiting. Oh. Oh. Can we go to a second? Yeah. Uh, does, uh, certainly we can. Are you ready? Okay. We can wait. We're willing to wait for you, Tony. I know it'll be good news, so we're excited. Well, so on the next slide, uh, I want to uh, let you all know that... Uh, I want to let you all know that we've had six nominations. Um, on the next slide, Francine, uh, the nominees are Ed Craven, Jim Searden, Margot King, Nancy Elizabeth Keller Nelson, Sue Linderman, Seidel Lopez. And having looked at the, uh, the nominee forms, uh, it's going to be really tough for this uh, committee to make its mind up as who the senior of the year is because they all have wonderful volunteer backgrounds and have done amazing things. So um, stay tuned. Next slide. Um, in addition to that, we're accumulating door prizes. So far, donations have been received from the YMCA, the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program, the Reserve, Home Watch, Julie B. John of Italy, and Skin Spa, and uh, we expect more of those to occur. So. You need to save the date. It's June 2nd, Thursday at the Goebel Center. We're working on a really scrumptious menu. Uh, tickets go on sale May 1st. Watch for our ads in the Goebel cassette in the May issue, the Acorn on May 5th, and tell your friends, and we'll see you on June 2nd. Tony, are the uh, nominations closed at this point in time? Yes, the deadline was April 1st, and okay. so we are now closed there. with nominations. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next um, commissioner report is from Commissioner Gorbach, who always brings us up to date on the latest things in education in our community. Karen. Thank you very much. You know, <clears throat> I have so many things to tell you, it's hard to know where to start. Oh, my gosh. there's. But the, the, I think the first thing I want to mention is that, you know, each month we hear about the terrific events going on at the Goebel Center, and they are fabulous, and I go to a lot of them. But I want you to remember that they have inexpensive classes all year long and free classes, free workshops, and you need to check out the Goebel Gazette, and you can see it online, or you can pick up a copy in the lobby over at the Goebel um, Adult Community Center. Beca and what I, I just checked this morning, just very, very quickly in two minutes to see what's happening. What If I wanted to learn how to use my computer, let's say I didn't really feel comfortable with it, there are computer classes for five dollars each I mean you can't you can't beat that one's called intro to computer another one is called introduction to internet and email this is at your local global community center here's another one that is uh, coming up on technology learn how to master your iPhone and this one um, get the most out of your iOS 9 devices I'm not even sure what that means but sounds sounds important if you have an iOS device and then here, here's one that's called Craigslist for people ages 50 and older. And this take this one-night seminar and learn how to use one of the most popular sites to buy and sell items safely. Safely, that's the key word. So always check, always check to see what's right in your neighborhood at the Global Center. And then let me tell you about a couple other things that are happening. The, um, the library on Jans just has so many upcoming programs. I, I'm just going to go over a few of them. Because April is National Poetry Month, you if you are interested in poetry, you have to go tomorrow night, April 7th, to hear a panel of um, faculty members from California Lutheran University speak on poetry, and they are going to have Jack Ledbetter, Jacqueline Lyons, and Joan Wines do a poetry lecture. And then this Saturday in the afternoon, 2 to 3, there will be an art lecture, Grave Spelenka, 
who is, is an illustrator and has illustrated for Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated, Playboy, New York Times, and so on, is going to be talking about his book on illustration and selling and autographing his book afterwards, Lecture on Art. There will be a lecture on Alzheimer's, Know the Ten Warning Signs. This is coming up Thursday, April 14th, also at the library on Jans Road from 6 to 7.30, presented by Ken Madden, President and CEO of Interim Healthcare. The faculty at Cal State Channel Islands come to town also and speak at the library. And this is one I put on my calendar. This is coming up on Thursday, April 28th. It's called Grief healing, and short fiction. If you're a writer, you're going to want to go to this. It's being given by Kristen Fitzpatrick, who is a lecturer in English at Cal State Channel Islands. She is going to read from her recently published collection of short stories and discuss the writing process, as well as some ways that a book's character face sudden losses of life, love, and community. So that is fabulous. So I will see you at a class real soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. I'll turn it back to you. All right. This is the point in our program where we open the floor for commissioner comments, which may be a little bit more personal in nature than what we've heard earlier. Anybody have any commissioner <laughs> yes. comments? Yes. Uh, this Thank isn't totally know. personal. I just wanted to update everybody on my mic is on, right? Uh, everybody on where we are with Caneo Valley Village. We're doing really well. We have moved along our 1023, which for those of you who have not tried to set up a nonprofit, is our federal form that you send in to get your nonprofit status. Uh, that is already in. We are hoping that we will have that straight by September of this coming year. At this point, we are planning to begin our actual membership drive in the fall of this year. We will not launch until next year, but it takes quite a while to get your members in, get volunteers trained. We just sent out a blast email uh, confirming again what Rick said about the garage sale and our participation in this garage sale. So if anybody did not get an email from Caneo Valley Village in the last week, uh, let me know, and I will make sure that your name is on that mailing list, because we send out email blasts to kind of update where we are. And we did have, before this fundraiser, we have had one other fundraiser, and it was at, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, yes, at uh, Topper's Pizza, and it was really very successful, much more so than we thought, plus it was really fun getting together. So we will be doing some more of the neighborhood restaurant fundraisers, and it's fun. You get to see people, you get to enjoy a good meal, and contribute to a very worthy cause. So if anybody is not on the, did not get a recent email blast, let me know. Please come to the garage sale on Sunday. It should be a really fun event, and some very good bargains will be there for you. So please, thank you very much for your support so far. And Mr. Healy, who is we? You, me? You, no, you oh. kept referring to we. We uh, on Canal Valley Village. Who, oui. And who is that? You. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, one of a, a different role I have is I am on the board of directors of the Caneo Valley Village. It has nothing to do with this, but it does have to do with something we think is a great program for that we, me, I think it's a great program for the community. So we do appreciate your interest, all of us on Canal Valley Village. Oh, yeah, I just was Got seeking it. some clarification. <laughs> yes, okay. Valley all Valley of us. Not a currently it's like, a project no, but project. there are people that are really there all the time. So thank you guys. We've gotten a lot of good support, a lot of questions from people. So if you want to get involved in any way right now in development, later on when we're actually providing volunteer services, just let me know. We are very eager to have involvement from people. So. Hey, Ron, were you? Yeah, I just wanted to get a plug in for our Council on Aging Outreach Program. If you have a group of people who are getting together and you need a speaker, I'll be glad to come out and I could probably talk Commissioner Healy into coming out and talking about the village <laughs> and she can answer any questions you might have. So just give us a call and uh, we'd be happy to come out and, and enlighten your group. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. Um, next month, May 13th and 14th, is the Ms. Senior Ventura County Pageant. 
and it is the preliminary pageant for the Miss Senior California pageant. Now, I am talking about this because I entered last year, and I will tell you, it is among one of the most fun things that I have ever done. I know you're out there, and, and you, if you ever watched a pageant as a kid, like I did, always watched the Miss, Calif the, the Miss America pageant and walked around with a book on my head pretending I was a model. If you've ever kind of thought in the back of your head, gee, I wonder what that's like. This is your opportunity. This is your, do it. Don't be afraid. Get out of your comfort zone. I was scared, but I did it and met the most wonderful people and had so much fun. And I would encourage anyone out there to go ahead. I'm going to give you a phone number to call. The person who is the pageant director is a delightful woman whose name is Elvia. And she can be reached at area code 619-261-4451. Five, one. Or if you want, would like to chat with me about it and see what the whole thing is like, I'd be happy to talk to you. Simply call Francine in her office at area code 805-381-7362. Leave your name and phone number, and I'll be happy to give you a call back and tell you what that's all like, because it is terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Gorbeck uh, modestly failed to mention that she was our local winner last year. So you can really get expert advice from her. So <laughs> she give credit where credit is due. So thank you very much. Okay. All right. Other comments? All right. Well, some of you in the audience and watching us on television may have been asking yourselves, how can I get one of these really neat nameplates to <laughs> put on my desk? Or how can I get to sit up in one of these comfortable high back chairs? And your opportunity is about to uh, come upon you. The uh, city is opening the uh, Council on Aging for uh, new members every year. Each of the commissioners on the Council on Aging serves two-year terms, and so half of the Council on Aging uh, gets turned over every uh, year and so forth, or is up for uh, reappointment or replacement. Um, so if you're interested in a position on the Council on Aging and so forth, uh, now is the time to begin to think about it. Uh, the application process, I understand, uh, I'm talking to the city clerk's office today, will be open later today or tomorrow. Uh, so check with them uh, either online or in person and so forth, maybe tomorrow. And, and uh, there's a 30-day process, 30 days in which you have to apply before the application process will be closed. But please give it your serious consideration. You need to be a resident of Thousand Oaks, and you need to be at least 55 years old. Uh, and you need to be uh, free of other encumbrances on other city commissions. And so well, you can only serve on one city commission at a time, that is. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's uh, open to all citizens. So please give it some serious thought. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Commissioner Gorbach to introduce our guest speaker today. Great. Thank you very much. <coughs> It is my pleasure today to introduce Paul Knorr, Certified Financial Planner from Buck County, Buck Country County Financial, and he specializes in retirement planning. He's an educator and a writer from Westlake Village. He teaches seminars on Social Security, as well as one called Mindfulness and Your Money and many other topics. And he's a good writer. He writes for the newsletter Boomer Angle and many other publications. And I've, I've read Boomer Angle and always enjoy it. And we're really happy that you're going to spend some time with us today. He's going to talk about financial strategies for seniors. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for that kind introduction. Um, uh, commissioners, city staff, um, members of the audience, uh, very happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be speaking to you about uh, issues that absorb me all the time in my work world and that I think are very important, and it's the whole world of uh, financial issues, financial concerns, financial decisions that face um, older adults. Uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm a financial planner, and I do f specialize in dealing with the issues that people face in retirement, different challenges they have. And I like to say, most simply, what I do is I help people make good financial decisions and, and maybe more importantly, avoid making bad decisions. 
and that covers a lot of territory, and uh, that's what I'll be getting into today. The uh, company I'm with is Bucks County Financial Planning Group. That's from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. We're, we're small, but we're on both coasts, so how cool is that? It was only on Monday, just a couple days ago, an article came by my desk, and it said, How to Sell to Seniors, 2016. And I thought, how timely. I'm going to be, going to be addressing the Council on Aging this week. I'm going to read this article. Well, there was nothing scandalous in the article. There was nothing untoward, nothing bad about the information. But it was simply a, a piece from the insurance world. It was an insurance publication talking about things you want to know if you want to present financial products, insurance products to seniors because there are a lot of needs, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of opportunities. So, I mean, this is partially emblematic of what we're facing. And uh, what we're also facing is there's so much information coming our way. Just, just uh, an hour ago, two hours ago, I was waiting for someone at a coffee shop I was going to meet, and I was reading about some new research about long-term care and about the real, uh, what, what some new research says about what needs people really have, statistically speaking. And I've always been questioning those statistics because the only statistics we've had up to this date come from the insurance world. And here's something that came from Boston College that did some research. And I still haven't studied the numbers, but there's so much to follow. I'm going to be talking about financial products. And I, I'm going to be kind of doing an overview of all the issues that, that people face. The agenda, what I'm going to do is, first of all, talk about the world of financial products. What the heck are we talking about? I'm specifically going to take a deep dive into annuities. Why annuities? Well, they're certainly germane to older adults. There are a lot of different ones. They're complicated sometimes controversial, and they're a good example of just the kind of things one encounters in the world of financial products. I'll talk about the traps and warning signs that you should be aware of as you're dealing with any kind of financial products. And last of all, I'll give some recommendations. In this seminar, I, I mean, you know, the PR that I put out was maybe a little misleading. I'm not going to be talking about any one specific product that much. But I'll be touching on a lot of them and trying to give you some overall perspective on how to deal with these things. Older adults in general and financial products, uh, you know, there are a number of points worth mentioning right off, right, right at the beginning. One, we, we have the most money, the most wealth in the country by far. I, I don't remember the statistics, but the amount of wealth controlled by people over 65 is enormous. So there's a lot of wealth there, a lot of you know, financial professionals and financial people offering financial products more than happy to help you deal with that wealth. Uh, older adults certainly, as you all know, have unique needs, whether it's health care, unique financial needs, unique income planning needs. And I can tell you from uh, you know, a, fin a financial planning perspective, the hardest thing about planning finances for retirement is that we don't know how long we're planning for. We don't know how long we're going to be here. We're typically not working. And you know, so you've got to aim at a target. You don't know what it is. Try to make assumptions. Try to figure out how all these things work. Not a simple task. Isolation is an issue. You all understand that. And not everyone is isolated, but everybody is isolated at some times. And, and unfortunately, some people are isolated a lot. That presents you know, specific concerns. Uh, last point, I think it's fair to say older adults are more vulnerable in as much as they're more trusting in some ways. The, um, the Gallup organization does tremendous research and they do this fascinating study. Every year, they do a, uh, a study on happiness. They go to 50 countries, this is astounding, they go to 50 countries around the world ask 3,000 participants in 50 countries a set of very well thought out questions about uh, to try to gauge how happy people are. Around the world, year after year, country by country, they regularly find people over 65 are the happiest group of all. And people over 75 are even happier. And, that, and what do you say? I see smiling faces. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm in my early 60s, but I'm get, I get that. It makes sense to me, and it's very fascinating to see. 
also, um, you know, other research uh, has shown that uh, people tend to be happier and more optimistic. And I can go into the psychological research, but I'll hold off on that example. And anyway, so other concerns here for uh, those of us who are older and financial products. So what are we talking about? We'll start with simple things. Simple banking products, you know what these are, checking accounts, banking accounts, but they're not simple, maybe. You know, does your checking account have a minimum with it? When do you get charges? Or if a check bounces, what are the fees involved? You know how complex that can be. Banking accounts, debit cards, credit cards, we know about that. CDs, certificate of deposits, not so interesting these days with low interest rates, but uh, maybe someday they'll be more interesting, but these are simple products. Moving to the investment world, well, I struggled to keep this on one page. <laughs> My font was getting smaller and smaller. But starting at the top, many people know what mutual funds are. Then there are things called exchange traded funds. There are things called retirement income products. What in God's name are those? Well, who knows? It, there are financial institutions that offer these things. It takes a while to explain. Can't do it here right now. It's another seminar. The next one down, REITS, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. These were really popular mm, seven, eight years ago. They were offered as a great opportunity for people because interest rates are so low, CDs aren't going to give you a good return. You can invest in REITs, get 7% return. It's all great. Well, here we are seven years down the line. It turns out there were a few flies in the ointments with REITs. There were high commissions built into those. They're not returning principal the way the expectations were, so, but they're complicated. This is the point. There are partnerships, separate the branch accounts, structured notes, hedge funds. It could go on and on. That's just the investment world. Home financing. People talk a lot about the issue of uh, cost of health care, of, of health care for older adults. Well, the cost for maintaining your home and home care is a much higher expense as a percentage of, uh, you know, expenses for older adults. And the common, you know, we all know forward mortgages, which are just, is just a name for normal everyday mortgages, but they're reverse mortgage mortgages. It's that Queens, okay? Yeah, you know, they're reverse mortgages, and uh, I know you've heard about those, I think, in some different presentations here. They're fine products. They've changed a lot. They were more controversial 10, 15 years ago. They've gotten better. They've gotten more conservative. May be appropriate, may not. There's home equity line of credit. There are other kind of things. So that there, are, there are these products, and there are more just in the home financing world. The insurance products. Now we're really going to town. Start at the top things you really know. HO is homeowners. Homeowners insurance. So do you have that? Do you have earthquake insurance or not? Auto insurance. Medicare, you may have Medicare Advantage, that's one plan, or you may have supplemental coverage, and then you'd have separate drug coverage. Long-term care insurance, uh, you know, that's been uh, a huge topic. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we get into the whole world of life insurance. Term, universal, whole life, variable. That's just insurance. Then we have the combo products. Okay, so LI is life insurance. So life insurance with long-term care rider. These have been popular the last 70 years. Well, not popular, but they've come onto the scene. You can buy a universal life life insurance policy. And for an extra fee, maybe an extra 1% per year, you can get this little extra thing that said, if, if, before you, if in your life you need long-term care and you need the funds, you can take it out of the life insurance policy. So interesting, but it's combining needs and it gets confusing and how does it all play out? Next one down, annuities and long-term care riders, same kind of combo product. Last one uh, on that list, bundled insurance and investment products. VUL is variable universal life insurance. So this is a life insurance policy, but there are in, there are invest there is an investment account with mutual funds kind of tied in with the life insurance policy, kind of different, it kind of pays each other, there are more fees involved, they're confusing, point being they're confusing. VA, variable annuity, same kind of thing, you can have an annuity, but that annuity has also mutual fund investment accounts, you have to make investment decisions, there's different fees, they were, they've gone in and out of popularity variable annuities, in and out of popularity over the last 20 years. I've seen at least two cycles. 
the kind of not so popular right now. So there are all these things. And if you're ready to scream, I'm ready to scream, but there's more. I'm still screaming. Now we get to annuities. I've listed some of the annuities at the top of my head, the different kinds you might encounter. There are median annuities, indexed annuities, deferred annuities. There's the dreaded variable annuities. There's something called longevity insurance. What in God's name is that? Four years ago, uh, I mean, I'm in this world, so I follow this stuff all the time. I encountered the term four years ago, longevity insurance. What is that? Well, it turns out longevity insurance is simply, if you go up, up to on the list, it's a deferred annuity with a few different features and has a fancy new name. So, okay, it's something that exists before, but another complication. Only recently, I encountered the idea of an immediate need annuity. And this was presented to me uh, as something, it's a long-term care strategy where you buy this long-term care product once you get sick, which is contrary to how all long-term care insurance works, right? So you buy it when you get sick and it's great. Well, what is that? It's basically an immediate annuity with a few other features. Point being again, a complication, different terms, different nuances, hard to keep track of it all. Last one, it's uh, CLAX has a great acronym, acronym, and they are qualified longevity annuity contracts that are covered by the picture. And that's something that the IRS just uh, determined last year that for people who have IRAs and 401ks, that you can now buy those within those products up to 25% of your uh, account. And those are basically their deferred annuities of a certain kind. Again, another term, similar product, a little bit different, a lot to keep track of. I want to talk about annuities a little bit because, because they're interesting and, it's, uh, and it's, it's germane. It's an example of the complexity, but it's also uh, they're of interest to those of us who are older. There's this cute saying, you may have heard this, I don't know, or if you don't, it's, it's common in the insurance world. Life insurance protects against the risk of, of living, of dying too soon. And annuities protect against the risk of living too long. In both cases, really you have to qualify because there's only a simple life insurance policy and a simple annuity. But life insurance, typically, most typically, most fundamentally, people buy that mostly when they're young and they need to protect people who, if, or depending on their income, would, would need something to protect them if these people died unexpectedly young. There are other reasons, but that's one core, core reason. Annuities, the most basic reason people get annuities is so that you can have some dependable, ongoing, semi-guaranteed stream of income, year in, year out, year in, year out, year in, year out. So these are kind of two ends of the coin in the insurance world. So I wanna talk about how annuities work in specific, uh, specifically and it's best explained with an example. So imagine you're retired, and, or maybe you don't have to imagine, you are retired, and you have uh, $50,000, and you have, you know, maybe you have Social Security and you know, some other money somewhere else, but you have $50,000 and you say, well, let me see. I'm planning my future and I'm gonna need to spend that over the, over the years, over 10 years, say, and I need to spend 5,000 a year. So, okay, you can do that. You can put the $5,000 in a savings account or a checking account, and you can take out $5,000 a year. Easy. You know, think about it. Small problem there, it's um, cost of living. In other words, inflation. We know that $5,000 today doesn't buy what $5,000 is going to buy in five years. Uh, ideally, you'd like to preserve that ability to buy the same amount that you could. In fact, in the investing world, one of probably the core number one reason people invest, I mean the most fundamental reason, is to simply preserve buying power. So if prices always go up over time, your investment at least goes up a little bit, little bit, little bit, at least keeps, keeps up with it. So, so what could you do? We already mentioned CDs, as we all know, don't work. They worked well in the 1980s. Uh, I used to talk with my grandfather and he had CDs and he was rolling them over and his big concern was his new five-year CD, could he roll it over to 8.5% or 9%, <laughs> you know, incomprehensible interest rates to us today. That was then. This is now. CDs aren't an option, so what do you do? What are the options? There aren't too many. Um, other than involved in income products, which is another discussion, 
uh, one, of the, one thing you can do is invest it in, in the uh, financial markets, which means what? Stock markets, bond markets. You can invest it conservatively, and you can invest it conservatively, maybe half bonds, half stock. That's fair. Should be pretty good. What's it going to return? Well, we don't know. It's certainly not guaranteed, but you might reasonably assume maybe over 10 years you get a 5% return. Maybe. Don't know for sure. But even if we knew for a fact over 10 years it's going to average 5%, it doesn't go like that. It goes like this, right? You know the stock market? It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Last month it was down, this month is up a little bit. God knows what the future is going to bring. So if you need that 5000 every year, and when it's down there, oh boy, what do you do? Do you take out 5000 still when it's so low, which means you're going to be basically selling low? And when it gets high, do you all of a sudden say, oh, i got to take it out and put it over here? But you have to decide. You have to deal with it, and you have to manage it. It's not simple. seems simple, but once our minds and our emotions get involved, it's hard. So that's a complication. So in come insurance companies, and they say, hey, we have a deal for you. You give us $50,000, we will give you a legally binding contract called an annuity. And what we will do is we will pay you back a percentage of that 50000 monthly or yearly, whatever you want, for either a set period of time or, or for as long as you live, and that will give you regular income, and, you can, and they'll think about it. They'll manage it. They basically take it. They take your 50000 and lump it together with everybody else's 50000 or whatever they have, and they invest it, and they deal with the complications of the investment management. You have a guarantee. So uh, annuities are useful, and this is the most basic uh, reason why, why people are retired. You know, get annuities. Uh, opportunities come to them, or people talk about them, because it's, it's a way to get guaranteed income that's dependable and you can count on. And data shows, uh, surveys regularly show that people love guarantees. We all love guarantees, even people who are very well-to-do and don't even have a worry. If you ask them and you, you, you survey them, they say, give me guarantees. I love it. So have a degree of guarantees are, is a very useful thing. So this is where annuities uh, play into uh, you know, the world of investment planning. But now, annuities are just one example. And what you or all of us get is we get uh, financial questions, financial issues coming to us from all over the place. We talk to friends about it. We read about it in a paper. You may see it in the AARP. You may get cold calls. We regularly get things in the mail, free Italian dinner, come and listen to retirement income, Social Security, this thing or another, plan your future. Uh, you get this all over the place, and you have to deal with that world. So how are you going to navigate that world? And I, I want to talk to I want to give you a few ideas of things to watch out for. I want to start with mental traps. This is high-level thinking. Managing your finances is not just about the numbers. If it was just about the numbers, it would be actually easy. But ma managing, your ma managing finances is about managing the money and it's about managing your mind. And what goes on up here is, you know, the best laid plans, you know, will often go astray once we start, you know, digesting things through, through our mental filters. So I, I want to go through a few of these that will get us in trouble, and if you just at least remember these as you're encountering all of these financial issues, this is helpful. Uh, the fear of uncertainty. Life is uncertain. No news, right? You, know, you may get hit by lightning today. Uh, there may be an earthquake right now. We don't know. And anytime we can get some kind of stability and some kind of predictability, it's nice. So we have this deep, innate need to want to have this. And as you're dealing with your financial question, just realize we all want to grasp for an easy answer, a simple answer, someone just to say, yes, this will work, this will fix it. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But Suspend easy belief and just question and ask and realize that predilection. Um, overconfidence. Overconfidence is a big one. There are, there are some famous work done by these experimental psychologists that said uh, human beings as a rule, we are very overconfident about our ability to understand the world in general, not to mention the financial world. 
For instance, consider the world of either economics or politics. Nobody could predict the present political situation we're in with the presidential campaign. Nobody. The stock market, nobody can predict it, yet every day you can turn on the news and you will have either political commentators or economic commentators telling you why what just happened happened. Oh, it happened because of this or because of that or because of all these other things. And we can say, we can pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, okay, I've got it. So I know in the future I, I should do this or that, the other thing. We don't know. No one can predict because even, uh, you, know, you know, six months from now, no one knows like in the presidential campaign, next six months, who knows what's going to happen. So we don't understand nearly as well as we do, so we have to deal with that. There's a statistic. I love this statistic. Something like, they ask people, are you an average driver or better than average driver or worse than average? And 90% of the people say they're better than average, okay? So what do you do with that? So beware of, uh, of thinking you know more than you think you know it is a blind spot we all have. Paradox of choice. There are books written about this. The fact is, our society, we have so much wealth and so many opportunities, we have too much to choose from. It's certainly true, go to the grocery store, you wanna buy tomato sauce, you've got a whole aisle, uh, not a whole aisle, but you know, you've got 20 choices. What do you do with that? There is, there is a lot of research suggesting that this just makes people uh, stressed, frustrated, hard to make decisions, fundamentally less happy because there's just too much to choose from. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to mention. Yeah, there was a study, simple study. You know in grocery stores you can do taste tests, right? People set up this taste test with 12 jars of jams and jellies. You can try any of the 12 and you can buy any of the ones you wanted. And people, researchers studied how many people stopped and tasted, how many people bought something. And then they s did another study, where, or another test, they put out just six. When they put out just six, more people came by, more people bought. bought. Why? Easier to choose. Twelve things, you just throw up your hand and say, I don't know. Six, it's manageable. So we're overwhelmed with choices, certainly financial choices. That's an issue. Herd mentality. We all want to do what everybody else is doing. We certainly see this in California. I mean, what's happened with the cycles up and down of the uh, real estate market? And uh, I, I have family in South Dakota, and I remember this distinctly. This was like 1998. The stock market was booming. Those of you who can remember, it was going up 20% a year. Some stocks were going up 50%. It was all good. Everybody was excited. And one of my relatives, who knows nothing about this, he said to me, and I quote, I've got to get me some of that Yahoo. <laughs> now, he didn't know what it was about. It's a recipe for disaster. And there were plenty of people doing that. Because why? Everybody was doing it. And, uh, and on the flip side, e you know, a misery loves company. You know, if we're all going down, we all go down together, it feels better than going down by yourself. So. Beware of herd mentality and fear and greed overall. So point being, there are a lot of ways that uh, you know, our, our, our minds uh, filter through all the good information anybody could tell us, and we can read the good articles in Money Magazine, have some r cognizance and some attention to the fact that we have these predispositions at, as human beings in general we're often not even aware of them. They've been well proven and they will get us in trouble. So give yourself some pause I in the middle of your financial deliberations for this reason alone and try to remember these things. Other traps, rushing. You're, pre you're presented with a reverse mortgage. That's just the greatest thing since sliced bread or you know, a certain kind of investment. There's no rush. Dollars to donuts, whatever is in front of you, you can wait, you can take your time, don't feel compelled to do anything quickly, there's lots of time. Going it alone is the worst one, it ties in with isolation, it has to, and it has to do with the fact that there's so much information, I can't keep up on this. I mean, th this is why I kind of chose this topic, which is a little bit nebulous to talk about, because I myself get stressed. I get stressed trying to keep up on this, because that's what I'm, I do professionally, to try to keep up on investment choices, 
and insurance issues, annuity issues, and reverse mortgages, and what's the latest with Social Security, and how do you work in tax planning, and how do you mix all this together to make it work well? It's, it's a lot of work. And I think to myself, how in God's name does an average person deal with it when someone's trying to sell them a variable annuity? Who knows? Still more traps. I want to talk about, uh, briefly, professional enthusiasm and professional abuse. They're very different things. Professional enthusiasm is a term I made up just for this presentation. There are a lot of people, and I know these people, and uh, I know many of them, they're colleagues, they're friends, they're good ethical people, and they, uh, they sell things. They sell life insurance, they sell annuities, they sell reverse mortgages, and they're, but they live, eat, and breathe this stuff. And they're excited about it, and if they're good, many of them are, when they sit down with you, they'll help you understand the pros and cons. But nonetheless, they are excited about it because this is what they do and this is how they make their living. And you're gonna be sitting, if you're talking to these people, you're gonna be sitting across from them and you know, whatever you say, they're gonna say, oh yeah, 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 but it's this, but it's that, but it's that, and they've got answers for everything. They'll get my head spinning when I s talk to some of them. And you g you're gonna have to be ready, maybe to be aware of your mental traps, to just step back and say, okay, 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 I think I understand, I need more time, whatever it may be, but you're gonna be with somebody who's enthusiastic and is just ready to go, Oops. <laughs> is, re is, is ready to go. So you have to deal with that, but these are well-intentioned people and I hope any of my colleagues who hear this don't take this the wrong way. <coughs> Professional abuse, a whole other thing, it's not common, but uh, I just uh, happened in my research for this, I just came across a list of, in the investment world, the four biggest ways that, uh, the four most common complaints that the uh, investment industry gets about uh, malfeasance from financial professionals. And there's misrepresentation, people will just uh, give you either omit important information, not to mention give you bad information. There's cold calling and harassing and just you know, berating people. There's unsuitability, selling the wrong product for the wrong person. And the last one is just unauthorized trading, buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. A little aside. Um, so there's the professional world you have to deal with. Some warning signs. If it sounds good to be true, it probably is. And tied in with it would be the second one, beware of big benefits with little risk. If you're ever presented with a financial opportunity and it just sounds good, there's gotta be a downside. It, 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 the, it, it, it does not exist without the downside. And what I mean is, if someone said, here's an annuity, it will pay you 4% and there's no downside, everybody in the world would say, hey, 4%, no downside, why not do it? So many people would pile into it that the price of it would go up so high that eventually it would outweighs the benefit and the 4% would become 3%, 2%, 1% and very little because everybody would want it. It's kind of the market in action. So if there is an annuity paying 4% and there are, there are some risks and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong, it's not a bad thing, but you have to understand what they are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I mentioned awkward feeling, again, kind of a psychological thing. If you're dealing with someone and you're having a conversation about maybe an investment product, something they're enthused about, you may feel awkward. It's just you and them, or maybe you know, you're know you a couple, you're there talking with this person, this professional like me, and they're going on and on and on, and uh, maybe they're a nice person, you like them, you don't want to offend them, you want to say yes. I mean, I've heard these things from people. I don't, oh, he's such a nice guy, I don't want to, you know, turn them down. You have to be ready for that and just not give into it and, s and give yourself some time. Uh, pressure, if there's ever pressure, that's a definite warning sign. Step back, step way back, and consider what you're getting into. And you can summarize all those by say, trust your gut. No matter what, I would say trust your gut, trust your gut, trust your gut. Even if one time out of five you miss something because your gut was wrong, I firmly believe majority of the time your gut will be right. And if it's not right, you're not listening well. <laughs> you know, so listen to that gut. Give, give, uh, give some credence to what you're feeling about situations that you find yourself in. <coughs> so some recommendations and summarizing some of the things I've been talking about. 
Um, one of the most important ones is take your time. Occasionally you'll hear things, oh, this product is going to expire, this contract is going away, this won't be available next month. Occasionally that is true, yes it is. But that should not be a major uh, motivator or a major part of your equation as you're weighing products. Much more important to let the possible opportunity slide if you're not clear on uh, all the other ramifications, all the other risks that are involved in this investment, this annuity, this insurance policy, this reverse mortgage, whatever it may be. Recognize your mental traps, I mentioned that. Understand the pros and cons, the benefits and costs. I mean, it, it has to, it's kind of like the same risk discussion. Anything you, you buy has got upside and downside. A good professional you're dealing with, they will help you understand. Yes, this is good, but you know, if you buy this, there's gonna be this, this cost in there that's really buried that you don't see, or you may not be able to, if you buy a REIT, like a real estate investment trust, really it's gonna be hard to sell it. So you have to understand these things, you should understand it. Don't go into anything where you don't understand the, the cons as opposed to the pros, or in addition to the pros. Understand how company benefits. This is a good one. If someone presents something to you and it sounds so good, so good, maybe it is, but I've had situations where I say to them, well, wait a minute, I don't get it. How does the company benefit? They, the company should benefit. They're in business, that's fair. And with long-term care pricing, uh, this has been in the news for a while. People who bought long-term care policies 10, 15 years ago, what they've been seeing, you may know, in the last five years are dramatic increases in premiums. Why? There was nothing, no, no shenanigans about it, but the companies that sold these policies, they made bad assumptions. Or there was, they made the best assumptions they could. When they sold the policies, insurance companies always say, well, let's see. If we sell 100 policies, we know that 10% of people are going to stop paying after maybe five years. They'll never collect anything, it'll just be money in the bank to us. And that's part of their equation. And then some percentage of people will keep the policy and collect benefits. Well, it turned out long-term care, people were keeping the policy. People were not dropping the policy. All of a sudden, the, the companies selling it were saying, oh my God, we're gonna be on the hook for all these people keeping their policy. They're not dropping it. Also, we're living longer, and more people, at least statistically, are needing long-term care because we're living longer, so more people are gonna collect benefits. So the company is saying, oh my God, another reason we're gonna have to pay more benefits. So all of a sudden, their pricing model doesn't work. So they've been raising, uh, they've been raising benefits and they uh, raising premiums. They can't do this on their own. They have to go to the state ins department of insurance, you know, so a California department of insurance. They have to petition them. They have to explain all this, so it, it's and it's reviewed by the state. But nonetheless, this has been happening. Some people have seen thousand dollar increases in annual premiums for long term care insurance. So a little example of if a company is not benefiting appropriately it'll come back to be problematic in the uh, in long run. Comparison shopping is always good. M my wife and I right now, we're involved in, uh, we are trying to buy new, uh, new phones, you know, you know new, new iPhones. Oh my God, I, 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 we've had three trips in to talk to the, the Verizon people and, it's like, and I say one more time, okay, explain to me the monthly plan, you know, this plan, that plan, I buy the phone, I get it on credit. You gotta take time, you gotta take time with these things and as many times as it needs, go around and around and as dumb as you wanna feel, it's okay, G get the good information, don't make decisions until you understand it and do, do, and do, do some comparative shopping. I leave the most important for last and when I started thinking about this presentation, this was my first thought. Do not do this alone all these decisions you have to make. It's just too hard for too many reasons. The practical money reasons, the professional enthusiasm you're gonna deal with, the mental traps, the mental blinders that we all have. There's too many ways to get in trouble. You need someone else on your side. And you know, it can certainly be a trusted friend, a relative of somebody like that. That's certainly better than nothing. They may not know more than you know, but it's another set of eyes. People can look at it differently. Uh, it's a big place where, it, where financial professionals come in. If you have a relationship with somebody, 
who you trust and you use them, whether a financial planner or other financial professionals, and if they, especially if they don't have vested interest in a decision, they can help you think things through. This is the whole big deal about fee-only financial planners. Like my firm and I, we're fee-only. We don't sell insurance. We don't sell annuities. Other people like us don't sell these things. We just help people think it through. It's like, oh, okay, what should I do? What makes most sense for me? However you do it, don't go it alone. Find some way. Um, there's even at Senior Concerns, there's a, a pro bono financial planning uh, offering. And uh, I belong to the Financial Planning Association, and there are four or five of us who regularly donate some of our time to meet with people half hour, 45 minutes, and you know, people who can't afford to come in to, you know, to see a financial professional just to get some feedback on some financial questions, whether it's insurance or investing or family issues or you know, a, a ton of different things. So one way or another, don't go it alone. Too many dangers. In the course of preparing for the uh, seminar, I, uh, or the presentation, I just came across a bunch of resources that are, are useful. There's the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This came out of the Dodd-Frank Act of five, six years ago. They have a lot of good information. MyMoney.gov, FINRA, which is a financial uh, watchdog organization. They have a helpline for seniors. California Department of Insurance, they have a lot of information, and you've probably heard about the Ventura County Adult Protective Services Financial Abuse Specialist teams. So in summary, if I'm gonna leave you with three things, I'll leave you with these three. Take your time, recognize your traps, recognize the mental craziness we all have to deal with, and don't go it alone. All these things. And last off, this is still me, Paul Knorr. If people want to follow up with questions and things, they can do that uh, through this fashion. And uh, that is my presentation. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's our policy to uh, take questions from the commissioners only at this point. If there are members of the audience that have questions for Paul, um, that uh, you can uh, address those after the meeting is adjourned and so forth. This allows a little more privacy for things that may, uh, you may not want to have uh, everybody in TV land know about. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, uh, Ron? I just caught the tail end of a news program before I came over here, and I, I wonder if you're familiar with it. There's a new regulation that purpose of is to protect consumers from the uh, financial planners taking advantage of them. The new, I guess uh, Obama came out with this in order to protect people. And I think it has something to do with the way that financial planners uh, earn their money. And it, uh, yep. the bottom line is, I don't know if you know anything I about do. that. or yep. Could you comment on that? Matter of fact, I was just also reading about that at lunchtime, and it's not financial planners because um, financial planners, at least real financial planners, they uh, there's what's called the fiduciary standard, where when you deal with people, uh, you have a fiduciary standard means you have a financial, legal, and ethical uh, obligation to put their interest before your own, and you have to make help them make decisions in their best interest. Uh, most financial planners, uh, certainly people who are certified financial planners, uh, are obliged to act in that fashion with everybody. Uh, there are lots of people in the financial world, especially people who are uh, stock brokers and other investment professionals who aren't, who aren't really financial planners. They, they don't have that same uh, fiduciary responsibility. The legal responsibility they have is to sell you something that is suitable. So you can be dealing with someone who is obliged to sell you something that's suitable for your situation or someone to help you find something that is in your best interest. And this has been a battle royale that's been going on for about five years because the investment world has been fighting it tooth and nail. They don't want to have, some of us in the financial world already do a fiduciary standard, like I say, most financial planners. But there are a couple hundred thousand stockbrokers they call registered reps. They don't have that standard. They don't want to have that standard. And they've been fighting it. The Department of Labor's been involved. And finally, a ruling came down that they're going to extend 
a mandatory fiduciary standard to anybody helping people with IRAs, with 401ks, and especially with the whole question of rollovers. Rollover, like a 401k into something else. So this has been a huge issue, um, and uh, it's fun. And yes, it was, it was supported by President Obama, but a lot of other people have been pushing for that. I don't know if, if that made it, made it clear, but that's what the issue is about. Can I say more about it? Is that enough? <laughs> okay. Yeah, Karen. Thank you very much. A very, very interesting presentation, Paul. Um, I'm interested in education. Mm -hmm. and I'm interested in education. And what does it take to become a certified financial planner? There are a lot of people who call themselves financial planners and um, financial mm -hmm. professionals. But, but what mm -hmm. does someone have to go through to get that, that certification? Yeah, well, well this, uh, this points to a, a, another huge source of confusion for an average consumer trying to deal with the financial world is who the heck are you dealing with? Because a lot of these names are thrown around, financial advisor, financial professional, financial planners. Uh, unfortunately, financial planner is not a protected term. It's not like a CPA where you can, you know, you have to go through a, you know, a, a certain, you know, a certain required uh, set of things to call yourself that. Now, certified, that's why people like certified financial planners. Certified financial planners, you have to go through, well, I went through an, an, an eight course program at UCLA and where you learn all these different, you don't just learn how to, you don't learn how to sell things, you learn how to help people plan things. And you go through, you learn estate planning, you learn tax issues, you learn investment things, you learn a little bit of everything. And uh, then you have to work in, the, in, as in that business for three years and then get three years of experience under your belt and then you can be a certified financial planner and you have to go through regular uh, uh, um, continuing training and continuing ethics training and these have to be done at regular intervals. So there is a standard with, with CFPs. That's why CFPs are a big deal. But you know, anybody in this room, you could call yourself a financial planner and y you wouldn't get in legal trouble which leads to lots of trouble for consumers. You don't know who you're dealing with. This is one of the hardest, hardest things for folks. Is the, cert is the certification uh, state or national? No, no it's, who it's certifies? It's, it's certified through, a, through, a, through a, a national certifying body. It's called the, the CFP Board of Standards. So it's an industry, it's an industry certification, not, not, not through the government. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I had one uh, a comment. There was something that I would have put right at the very top of your list of things to focus on at the, at the very end, and I'd like to illustrate it with an anecdote from another field. Uh, I recently went on a, uh, a photo tour led by a professional photographer in Japan, and um, as many of you may know, that there are a large portion of the cameras that are on the market today have something called burst mode or continuous mode where in, in this mode, you can hold the button down and it'll take mm -hmm. up to as many as 60 <coughs> pictures a second <laughs> for wow. as long as it, the camera has enough memory to have sort of absorb the, the pictures and so forth. So with a uh, very few seconds, you can take a couple hundred pictures. And we were doing that quite a bit in Japan because we were photographing birds in flight, things like that, that are sort of difficult to get just right. Um, and uh, I watched one evening the professional photographer going through his pictures. One of the problems here is you've got a couple hundred pictures that are almost identical, but one's the right one and mm -hmm. the rest you, you're going to throw away. And so the question is, how much time are you going to spend trying to find out where the right one is? So I watched this professional go through this process. He started off with his 200 pictures and went through them and nope, not that one, not that one, not that one. He, he finally got the one and says, oh, that's the one. And then he stopped. And he didn't look at any of the rest beyond that point. And the, what he was doing is saying, I know what my goal is. I know what the picture is that I'm looking for. Uh, and when I get that picture, I'm done. Uh, it doesn't really matter if there's a better one later on. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't really meet my goal. And, and I think the same thing applies to the financial world. You know, if you understand your own needs and your own goals, uh, it can help you a great deal to fight this grass is greener, you know, <laughs> somewhere else uh, syndrome. You know, that, 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 that's a great point. I'll, I'll just amplify that. <clears throat> I, I, I encounter, 
I like that point. I made that very point many times because, especially in the investment world, among professionals in this world, there are endless debates about how to invest. And this way will get you another half a percent, and this will do this, and this will do that. It gets so complicated. It gets so esoteric. And for my money, for 90% of us, if you get do the obvious things, get the low-hanging fruit, make the obvious choices, and those are the most important things. Worrying about just what you're saying. Worrying about that last 5% or getting a little bit better, unless you're totally obsessive and you know, love to deal with that stuff, let it go. Live your life. But you know, make sure again. Back to what I started with. Don't make you know. Try to make basically good decisions and avoid making really bad ones, and you'll you know do do it pretty well. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you. You had a question. Pardon? Tell me, how does a financial planner, uh, a fee-only financial planner, actually earn his money? Well, well fee fee-only means there are fees. Yeah, uh, you, you know, you know, so so they're paid paid fees. Uh, the the point the point being, uh, a fee is paid for advice, for advice and analysis and interpretation and you know figuring out your your cash flow and things of that nature, as opposed to. You sell an annuity, and if I sell you an annuity of hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to make I don't know three thousand dollars. So I don't make money for selling a product. I sell advice and consulting. Mm -hmm. So that's why f fee, you know, fee only means you're getting paid for advice, basically. How do you de determine the fee? <laughs> that's the magic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. It's, it's hard. I struggle with I honestly struggle with it. But uh, you, know, you, know, you, 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 you come up with them. Some people do percent, percent of net worth or percent of assets. And you know, I have ideas in my mind, but I'm always, if, if somebody is, doesn't have much money, I always, I'm always trying to lower things, but it's, it's smushy. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, I'm wondering um, if a 70 year old comes in for financial uh, advice and an 80 year old comes in, uh, I, I'm sure that the advice you give each would be quite different because of their expected life lifespans. Well, every, everybody's situation is different, even at the same age. I, I, I have one client, she's 88, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, very different. Depends. Because people are living much longer, I, I think that would have a definite effect on the type of plans you would suggest. Oh, it, it does. It, it, it is one of longevity. It, it sounds like a funny term, but in the financial planning world, we use the term longevity risk. The risk of living a long time, and we mean the financial risk. And it's real because it is a challenge, number-wise, you know, just the numbers, just the planning, to plan for if you retire at 65. And you know the statistics right now. What's the statistic? If a 65-year-old couple there's a 50% chance one of them will live till 92. I mean, and, and I've watched that statistic over the years, and it's been creeping up. 92, you know, it was 90, it's 91, 91 and a half, 92. And it's continuing to creep up. So that's, a, that's 25 years, maybe th approaching 30 years, you've got to think about. And there's no income coming in, and you just got this set pot of money, and maybe you've got Social Security, maybe there's a pension, maybe there's not, don't know, depends. And uh, but y y you don't know what that end target is, so it's, it's a challenge, and it's it's uh, longevity risk is one of the big ones. One of the things that I often suggest to people is that they locate a longevity calculator that they uh, feel comfortable with, and there are some of these on the internet. Living to hundred dot com is and, one. Uh, uh, that many of these involve different levels of detail about your situation, not only how old you are, but mm -hmm. what your state of health is, what. Mm -hmm. uh, chronic diseases you have and things like that. One of the things that I have not found is one that provides a standard deviation around that. Oh, and, you uh, old statistician, you. Yeah, <laughs> and the, the problem I have with it is that uh, most of them will give you a single number saying that the average person mm -hmm. in your condition mm -hmm. would expect to live to such a, such a thing. But, but I might not be the average person. I, I need to plan my money to last longer than that because I might live longer than the average person. So mm -hmm. uh, how do I deal with that? Well, most people, most people don't know what's, <laughs> Nick, I don't know how you deal with it. Most people have no idea what a standard deviation is, so. Well, how, how do you advise people that they deal with uh, 
say the longevity calculator says that my expected lifespan is till 95. What, well, well, what should I plan for? Well, 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 well generally, everything, if, if you deal with a, someone who does financial planner, does financial planning, they are going to make, they have to make assumptions because they're going to project into the future. Mm -hmm. And there are a dozen or more assumptions, maybe more, that go into this. And in fact, what I do with folks, I, I just do this, is like I have a long discussion about, here are all the assumptions I'm making. And, you know, assumptions about not just investment returns, and, you know, assumption about what I inflation is going to be for the next 25 years, assumption what tax rates will be, you know, assumptions about, uh, you know, how much healthcare expenses are going to go up. And there are so many of them, and you could tweak, you could tweak all of those and make numbers look great. So I always uh, edge on the side of being conservative. And, uh, you know, for instance, I just did a financial, I was dealing with somebody last week, and I said to them, you know, I only estimate that your investment portfolio will make 5% in the future. And she said, oh, well, my, this investment company, they said, the Vanguard said 7 or 8. I said, maybe, but I wouldn't base my numbers on it. I'd be more conservative. So I'm always, and, and as far as longevity goes, if you, the calculator said 95, I'd say, let's assume 100. And, you know, you, you, wa you want to do it that way. And this issue comes up a lot with Social Security because I teach, I'm teaching a seminar tomorrow on Social Security and people, it's a big part of that discussion because people always want to get their money back and don't know how early to start claiming Social Security, what should they do, and these issues always come up there too. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And finally, I would like to adjourn our meeting today in memory. From the audience. Not Did yet. They, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's right. All right. <laughs> All right. I know you said. Uh, yeah, I would like to adjourn our memory, our meeting today, in memory of Susan Bay Shore, who is a longtime friend of the Council on Aging, a member and team leader for Senior Adult Master Plan, who passed away recently. Um, so we stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.